Good morning, and welcome to this online service of Blackstone Presbyterian Church. Uh, we met in person last week. It went all right. Uh, I'm still mighty worried about it. Uh, indisputably, uh, watching uh, worship online is uh, safer than meeting in person. But we feel like we've done everything we can to, uh, to minimize the risk. Uh, we are keeping an eye on the uh, distressing news about the, the current increase in COVID cases around the country. Uh, we're going to be as careful as we may. Uh, and we're going to keep these online worship services continuing uh, for the foreseeable future. So we'll always have some way to connect with each other and to worship together. It's good to be with you this morning. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lift up your hearts. Let us all lift our hearts to the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this day and for every day. Every day is a gift to us that you have given us freely, that you have given us in your fullness. May all our days be full, even when they are restricted by lockdown and twisted by our fear of this virus, bind us together, make your presence known to us, remind us that in you we are all bound together as closely as brother and sister. We are your family, O oh Lord, and we give you all that is due to your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Early in uh, most Presbyterian services, we, we get the, the hard stuff out of the way uh, to sort of free us and cleanse us to be able to worship with uh, hearts filled with your grace and mercy. And so I say to you that if we imagine that we have no sin, uh, we are fooling ourselves uh, and not fooling a, a lot of other people. Rather, we acknowledge and confess our sins, uh, sure and certain of your grace and mercy. This morning we pray a prayer of silent confession. Let us pray. Hear the good news. None of us are in any kind of position to judge, much less condemn, another. The only person who is in a position to judge, the only one who is our judge, is Jesus Christ, who was born into this world for us, who lived for us, who died for us, and who rose again for us, who reigns in power over us, who prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Since God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ, what else can we do but forgive each other? The peace of our judge and redeemer, Jesus Christ, be with you and also with me. And now, as we pause to savor the peace of Christ, let us turn our hearts again to God. Let us pray together. We begin with prayer of silence in which we remember particularly uh, those people 
for whom we ask God's particular blessing this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for making all things, for making all things good. We give you thanks for making us in your own image to be creative just as you created us, to be makers just as you made us. You have given us the gift of imagination, creativity. You have given us uh, spirits that seem to always be questing and yearning for meaning and purpose, questing and yearning for you. May we use these gifts as fully as we may to participate in your plan for all creation, for your coming kingdom we give you thanks for this, this mighty task to play our small part in it, to be vessels, to be bearers, instruments of your blessing to all the children of this earth, to all the creatures of this earth, to the earth itself. Help us to be attentive and faithful in service, in bringing your blessing to those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit, to those who are dying, and to those who mourn their dead, to those who are hungry, to those who thirst, to those who lack adequate access to decent health care, good jobs, good education, secure old age. Oh Lord, may we never turn our faces away from all the needs that are before us. We ask your blessing on all those who serve others, all who are in positions that require them to work on behalf of others, for all those who wear one kind of uniform or another as a symbol of their service. We give you thanks for all those who are working in the field of health care to deal with this terrible pandemic. We give you thanks for the sacrifice and the courage and the dedication that they continue to display even when we are all so tired and weary of the restrictions in our lives, may we ponder and consider the sacrifices and the risks that others are taking on our behalf and resign ourselves to do whatever must be done to drive this pestilence from the earth. Or at least, dear Lord, to bring it to manageable levels. Be with the leaders of our church, of the church universal. Be with the leaders of our community and every community. Be with state, regional, national leaders. They are all called these days to make difficult difficult choices. Please be with them and guide them. Grant them wisdom and courage. Grant them compassion. Grant them intelligence to lead us through this crisis and through all the dangers that beset all of us all around the world. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who invited us to pray in this way, who, who inspired us to pray 
in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come this morning um, to the conclusion of Moses' leadership. I probably sound more euphonious. We come this morning to the conclusion of the life of Moses as he led the children out of captivity, as he was God's instrument in delivering them from Pharaoh, as he led them through the wilderness, as he comes to his last earthly encounter with God. Hear this passage from the very end of Deuteronomy. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in his entire land, and for all his mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. I've been there. One of the uh, the most memorable uh, trips I've ever taken. Uh, it was a seminary trip led by Union Seminary, as it was then known, uh, back in the very late 90s. I think it was 99. Um, we spent time in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, and in Palestine, in Israel. And we went to Nebo. Uh, in, in Bible study, uh, somebody said, how, how long a hike was it? And then I had to, to confess that the you know, bus drove us up there. Wasn't a far hike at all. But still, we walked a little ways um, out on Mount Nebo, and the 
leaders of that trip had arranged beforehand for us to take communion there. And there were three uh, fantastic professors on that trip. Uh, Stan Skreslet, who was at the installation service in February, and Sib Towner, and uh, kind of my hero, Dean McBride. Uh, Dean and Sib were two legendary biblical scholars. Uh, if you read in the NRSV, as I do every week, uh, Dean was the principal translator of Deuteronomy and a good bit of Exodus for the NRSV. Uh, a master of different languages. When he lectured in class, he would hold the Hebrew Bible in his hand and he would kind of translate it all as he went along. When he lectured, he talked not only in complete sentences, but uh, complete paragraphs, maybe whole chapters. And he became and remains uh, my model for both teaching and preaching to, these, to this day. And he uh, led us in communion. I was so proud. Uh, uh, I had uh, saved a little bottle of, of airplane wine, one of the little bottles they give you on those trips. I uh, know better uh, than to do a lot of drinking on a, on a plane like used to be the custom, but I am uh, uh, true to my Scottish heritage, and if there are free little bottles of wine going, I'm going to get one. But I had one in my day pack, and uh, that became the, the wine that we used for the communion. And the unleavened bread or semi-leavened bread that we had, had at breakfast became the, the body. And uh, Dean spoke to us there on Mount Nebo, and then we shared the Lord's Supper together. And oh, it was, it was memorable uh, to feel like you were standing uh, in the place where Moses stood. That was a feature of much of that trip, but I was particularly uh, entertained and, and just just uh, really enjoyed. If there was a shrine or something where generations of pilgrims had come up and, and kissed a rock, uh, Sib Towner, great soul that he was, would be right there in line and bending down to kiss that thing. And uh, on more than one occasion, I would find myself near Dean at the same place, and Dean would say, ah, Jesus was never within 10 miles of this place. And <laughs> it, was, it was a perfect combination. They were great friends, and they complemented each other uh, supremely well. But a, a memorable trip. But, uh, oh, this, this image, I think, doesn't it uh, reach to something deep? inside all of us, uh, don't we all feel uh, sorry that Moses, who had done so much, uh, who had been the exemplar of, of response to the, to the calling and commanding of God, uh, who, who, you know, was the leader of the children of Israel through this extraordinary journey, uh, who, who spoke to God uh, face to face, or at least face to pillar of cloud, or, or face to the backside of God. And Moses, uh, who has done so much to lead the children of Israel to this promised land, this land overflowing with milk and honey, is told by God that he will not complete that journey. It's hard to, to think about that and not feel compassion. And yet, the text does not say that, that Moses was unduly saddened by this situation. The text tells us that man lived to be 120 years old and his, his vigor was unabated. He was still uh, fully engaged in the world, still able to walk up a side of a mountain. He was given this glimpse, and then he died. And the text makes no big deal about this. It, it tells us of the 30-day uh, mourning period that the children of Israel 
the sons and the daughters, the nieces and nephews of those uh, folks who had originally been led out of captivity, perhaps even the grandchildren of, of that first generation, how they mourned, and I hope they did it the way we're all supposed to mourn, the loss of, of someone we value and love. They grieved good and hard for 30 days, and then they went on with their lives. They went on with the journey to see it through to its end. Moses was buried in a, in a hidden place, in a quiet place, so that his grave site would not become uh, just one more occasion to put together a golden calf or some commemorative stone. He was uh, avoiding there being such a thing as a cult of Moses. Rather, God was the God that, that should be the focus of all the children of Israel's religious uh, concerns and thinking and feeling. Moses got that glimpse of the promised land. What might that glimpse have meant to him? I think we Christians, naturally enough, uh, we talk about uh, glimpsing the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we talked about that in last week's sermon, uh, what those glimpses mean to us. This morning I ask you, what does the promised land mean to you? What, what does the kingdom of heaven mean to you? What might we say about, about what we have seen of the promised land, of the kingdom of heaven. It is a place of justice. It is a place of righteousness. It is a place, to my mind, uh, uh, American that I am, shaped by my culture as I am, uh, a place of freedom, a place of liberty, a place of equality. It is above all a place of compassion, a place of care for others, a place of service to others. An American as I am, I guess I can't help myself from, from acknowledging all the, the evil that flowed from the European discovery and conquest of this country, and Lord, there is no evil that did not flow from that moment. And yet, also from, from this encounter, from this development in the history of all people, the idea of a new world where new possibilities were all around, waiting to be seized, that was also part of, of our legacy, um, of that, that clash of civilizations, of that, uh, that brutal clash. And to this day, I somehow deep within me believe that there is room in this country for this specifically Judeo-Christian belief that there is such a thing as a promised land. There is such a thing as the kingdom of heaven, and it has been given to us to work toward the, the coming of that kingdom, to the completion of the journey. I don't think, as students of human history, we can expect ever to reach that perfect kingdom to reach that perfect destination. But isn't it always, always about the journey? Isn't it always about the, the vision? Maybe we can call it the light that goes before us. Isn't that there to sustain us as we treat each other equally, as we treat each other carefully? and thoughtfully, as we treat each other compassionately, as we treat each other mercifully, 
with forgiveness. As we treat each other above all things with love. That leads us right to the, the gospel uh, reading for this morning. But I'm going to save that for the very end of the service and uh, use it as part of our charge and blessing. First, um, I'd like to, to play maybe the first hymn I ever learned. When, when children are learning it, it has gestures, so you don't even have to be able to talk to be able to participate in the song. And because of its roots, uh, traditional roots and the spirituals, uh, it was meant to be sung differently every time it was sung, for every time uh, to be uh, singing a new song to the Lord. Because the light of God, the light of Jesus Christ, is a full light. It includes the fullness of all creation, of all things. So, uh, let's sing together if you're in a, in a mood to. Um, I'm going to kind of sing it like a prayer uh, that it sometimes uh, feels like to me. This little light of mine. This little light of mine I'm going to let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Everywhere I go, Lord I'm gonna let it shine Everywhere I go, Lord I'm gonna let it shine Everywhere I go Lord, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. It's the light of faith, I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of faith, and I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of faith, I got to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. It's the light of reason. I'm gonna let it shine. It's the light of reason. I'm gonna let it shine. It's the light of reason. And I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. It's the light of science. I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of scientific inquiry, and I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of proper scientific humility, and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. It's the light of understanding. I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of understanding, I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of understanding, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And above all things, um, above all things, it's the light of love, I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of love, and I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of love, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Mm. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, dear Lord, Lord of love, Lord of life, Lord of light, may your light shine through us every day in every way. Grant us all a glimpse of the promised land, a glimpse of the coming kingdom of heaven here on earth. In the name of Christ, we ask this. Amen. A legal expert tested Jesus. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and prophets depend on these two commands. Go forth. Keep those commandments with everything that is in you, and may the love of God the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.